Hi there, welcome to this um, lecture um, looking at the symbolic interactions view of crime and deviance for um, GCSE and I've made this lecture for those of you studying the Ediquas um, examination spec. Um, so what I'm going to cover in this lecture is um, uh, the idea that what we consider a typical offender, which is a concept you'll need to know, typical offender, um, the idea that it's socially constructed, and I'm going to talk through that process. Uh, we're going to look at how um, Howard Becker's labelling theory of crime and the idea that labelling is so powerful it actually creates crime itself. And then we'll finish by looking at how the media, the role of the media in crime uh, can actually be quite harmful, uh, particularly through their use of moral panics <clears throat> and actually can end up making crime much worse in society, according to Stanley Cohen. So if we start off with this concept of a typical offender, um, uh, and that's the definition, uh, an understanding of what a criminal is like based on stereotypes, usually a young, white or black, working class male. That's the if you like, society's idea of what a typical offender might look like. And what you guys need to be clear about if you're going to argue the symbolic interactionist view is that the typical offender doesn't exist. It's just the product of what society tells us is a typical offender. Symbolic interactionists don't think anybody is a typical offender, but society seems to hold these stereotypes about certain groups which society thinks of as more, more likely to be criminal. And in terms of the agents to mention here, um, the media is a big one for kind of pushing the idea of a typical offender on us, particularly through the news. The news tends to over-report on crimes um, that are often quite violent, often street crimes, which are much more visible, um, and where the main kind of um, offenders are more likely to be men and a lot more likely to be working class, uh, whether that's white working class or black working class. Um, they do seem to over-report on those studies, on those um, crim crimes and criminals. But other agents of socialisation are very much responsible for this, whether it's family members or friends or attitudes at work. There are other pressures on us to kind of believe in this notion of a typical offender. So as a result, if we see somebody that fits the idea of a typical offender, we might think, oh, they might be a bit dodgy. And that's because we've been socialised into these ideas, this social construction, constructed notion of a criminal. Just to be super clear, and this is again what symbolic interactions emphasise, these groups are not more criminal than others. Many in society just think they are. So as a result, they get labelled as criminal or deviant uh, and get targeted far more by the police. Now, because they're targeted more, they're far more likely to be stopped, they're far more likely to be searched, they're far more likely to be arrested. And as a result, they end up showing up in the crime statistics. So the typical offender idea gets proven true because they show up in crime statistics. But symbolic interactionists would say this isn't because they actually are more criminal. It's because they're being targeted more. And this is what social construction is, which annoyingly I have spelt wrong in this slide. Uh, it's social construction, not social constriction. Um, this is when what society believes to be true becomes the reality because, uh, if you like, the police, they're, they're people, so they're absorbing these kind of ideas of typical offenders from all these different agents of socialisation. Uh, and so they are more likely to approach um, and arrest people that conform to the typical offender idea concept. And what's worth mentioning is that women, particularly middle class, particularly maybe white as well, they may act criminally, but the difference is they just don't get caught as much because the police aren't looking in that direction. Which leads us to this idea of labelling, um, which I've touched on um, already. So Howard Becker is the guy behind labelling theory. You've come across it possibly in crime, in crime not crime, sorry, education as well. Um, so Becker argues that labelling is enormously powerful and labelling itself can actually create crime in, in different ways. Uh, the one that most of you be most familiar with would be the idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy. And I've given you a really, I've just grabbed a, a screenshot of self-fulfilling prophecy from the internet there. And this is a really complicated process, but it effectively what it means is that the way other people see us, okay, others' beliefs about us, they can have a huge impact on us. So if people act and treat us as if we're one thing, quite often we will start to believe that and think actually, oh yeah, I am that person. Um, and that's when 
if you like, other people's beliefs beliefs about us become our reality, they become our self-identity. So you might have come across this idea, for example, in education, where if teachers believe a student is, is rubbish, isn't doing, going to do very well, um, the student might feel that label, they might believe that label, they might believe that they're not going to do well because maybe the teacher's a bit horrible to them, the teacher ignores them, or the teacher says things to them like, oh, you know, you're never going to get anywhere, which would be really awful from a teacher. Um, but then the student might absorb that and believe that to be true. And then they don't try hard and they do really bad in their exams. That is a self-fulfilling prophecy. The teacher's been proven right. It's become true. That is the power of labelling from the education unit. In the context of crime and deviance, the self-fulfilling prophecy is very much there. Or instead of teachers, the main agent I'm going to talk about is, is really the police, but also the media can be very much, and wider society can also do these things. So a good example of policies that illustrate self and prophecy is stop and search. Uh, this is where the police can, um, un where if they've got reasonable suspicion that something dodgy is going on, they can stop and search an individual or a group of people. Um, but the argument is, from symbolic interactionists and others, that uh, this actually reinforces the negative labels on certain communities more than others. The police are far more likely to stop and search young men, uh, black men, uh, particularly working class or, or um, working class white men, far more than other social groups. And this is really problematic in society because this can actually create a sense of anime. This can make young people, older people, whoever's being stopped and searched, it can make them feel like they're not welcome. It can make them feel like they don't belong to their society. And it can make them feel quite angry and resentful of their society. And we know, and I'm crossing theories here, but it might be worth noting, people who do suffer anime, and that's a functionalist concept, but if they suffer anime, they're far more likely to commit crime because... They don't care about their community. They don't care about their area. They already feel rejected by it. But I'm going to go back to symbolic interactionism now. Um, so certain groups avoid the label of criminal, even if they commit a crime. And this is what um, symbolic interactionists are really critical of, okay, when it comes to particularly crime statistics. So in class, I've talked through this example. Um, imagine a middle-class woman and a working class woman, they're both in, I don't know, Sainsbury's, they both steal a bottle of wine. As they're leaving a shop, what, which of the two of them do you think is going to get stopped? Well, it's far more likely to be the working class woman. And that's because she's far closer to that socially constructed idea of a typical offender. Um, a security guard might um, look at both women and decide because of the way the working class woman is dressed, because of the way maybe she sounds when she speaks, she sounds like she's much more likely to be a typical off an offender. So they might ask to look through her bags rather than the middle class woman that might be dressed, I don't know, smartly uh, and speak in what we call elaborate code. Um, and as a result, they might not think they'd be a typical criminal. So they don't stop them and have a look through their bags. The issue is here uh, that middle class woman is just as criminal. She is a criminal because she's shoplifted a bottle of wine. But she avoids all the negative consequences of being caught. Once you get caught, um, you end up uh, being shamed, okay? You, um, other people find out that you've been caught for a crime, you end up being shamed. You can end up with a criminal record, okay? And that means you can lose the job that you've got. It also means that you might not be, to get, be able to get another job, okay? Or a good job, you might have to take up really low paid work. So the consequences of, of being caught for a crime are quite significant, other than, you know, obviously getting caught for doing a crime and, you know, being punished. It also has much longer term concept consequences in terms of that job loss and the criminal record aspect of it as well. Whereas the working class woman who did exactly the same crime, she's the one that ends up with all these different consequences and has to suffer as a result. Um, and this kind of links to this other concept from Becker that you need to be aware of, which is known as master status. And our master status is the main way we think of and identify ourselves and others. Most of us have multiple roles and multiple sources of status as the day goes on. I always use myself as an example. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a friend, okay, uh, among other things. However, if I had a master status, it would be the only way people would see me. Okay, it'd be the first thing that would come to mind when people bumped into me. So if you get a criminal label, it is so powerful that it completely wipes out your other roles, other labels that you might have had. It becomes your master status. It's the only thing people think of when they maybe first see you. 
or even after they see you for some time. And Becca says we need to be really concerned about this process because it can lead to what's known as a deviant career. So I'll give you a a clearer definition about that in, in a minute. Now, the reason this leads to a deviant career is because having a criminal master status means that quite often we might be cut off from friends and family. They might not want to spend time with us. They might reject us. They might be ashamed of us. I've already mentioned you're unable to get a good job and you're far more likely to suffer social rejection by the wider community. People might just, you know, be a bit uh, dismissive of you. People might talk about you behind your back. People might be reluctant to invite you along for things. Which, of course, all of these things end up creating that sense of anime that I talked about before. Um, And the argument is, from Becca, that this creates more crime because the criminals become outsiders in society. So I'm talking about people who perhaps have have been fined or been punished, who've gone to jail but come out again. Despite the fact they might have served the time and been punished, they still feel like outsiders. And this is what makes crime more likely. If people feel like outsiders then they seek a sense of belonging elsewhere. So crime can become a survival strategy because they're not able to access jobs. But more more significantly, they may actually join a deviant subculture for a sense of belonging. Now, if they join that deviant subculture to gain that belonging, this is the beginning of the deviant career because they're going to spend time with other people who see crime as normal. Okay, whatever that crime might be, whether it's stealing or if it's drug dealing or drug use, their norms shift, okay, because the subculture sees crime as normal. So as a result, all the members commit more crime to fit in with that social group, largely because they've been rejected by wider society. So Becca is quite concerned, for example, about the justice system in in the UK, because one of the things it does is it does really shame criminals, but it, that, as a result, makes it really difficult for them to reintegrate to society. Um, and when people are reintegrated, they're less likely to commit crime. But if they don't, they're more likely to turn to these sort of deviant subcultures and crime as a survival strategy. OK, the last aspect I want to talk to you about is um, moral panics, OK, which uh, sit within the symbolic interactionist theory. Now, um, symbolic interactionists are really critical of the role of the media um, in society. And they quite often say because it does often distort crime, make through things like moral panics um, and it can actually make crime worse. So a moral panic is when the media exaggerates a problem to make it appear as a threat to society. And the people really, uh, the people who get focused on, or people who are what I, I sometimes use the word victim, people who are a victim of um, a moral panic, they become what's known as folk devils. So Stanley Cohen said that the media will often over-report on minor crime and deviance and make it seem like it's much worse than it is. And normally the group um, who are, if you like, targeted, um, they're quite a powerless group in society. Um, often young, often minorities, often working class, um, who haven't got much of a voice. And this group are scapegoated through the moral panic. They are blamed for something awful that's happening. And they become these sort of folk devils. And he, he used that term on purpose, this idea of a folk devil, because it's almost like a myth, a mythical creature. Um, because quite often the crime or deviance was nowhere near as serious as the media was making it out to be. And Stanley Cohen said we need to be concerned about this because this creates much more crime through a process known as deviancy amplification. So this is another quite key concept in sociology. So deviancy amplification is is basically what the word says. The deviance is amplified. The deviance is made worse because of how society reacts to the initial, normally quite minor deviance. Uh, So that might be the media, the police, the way they approach that community. The government might create new laws and legislation to target that that particular deviance and um, even the general public's reaction can actually make that group either feel labelled or feel targeted or feel that they can't actually kind of interact with what mainstream society so have to turn to deviance in order to survive or have a sense of belonging. Um, the example we talk about, the hit, well, Stanley Cohen wrote about this, was the, the example of mods and rock, the mods and rocks, rockers coverage. <clears throat> Um, and this was in, um, goodness, was it early 1960s or late 1950s, where on one random bank holiday weekend, um, the mods, which is one youth subculture, uh, 
had a bit of um, a fight with the rockers at a seaside town. Um, there was some violence. There was some property destroyed. I think a few bus shelters got trashed and I think um, some tables and chairs and maybe a few windows got broken as well. And yet the police did make some arrests. Um, and that's kind of it. There wasn't much more to it than that. But because of the way the media covered that event, the mods and rockers, the youth subculture, culture is sorry they became the folk devils and the news coverage was astronomical people really whipped themselves up into a level of hysteria um, people were talking about it on talk shows on national tv on national news all over this kind of quite minor event at one seaside town now what happened was that all of these young people who were members of these two different types of groups around the country they felt a bit labeled and uh, they felt that everyone was telling them that they were going to go and have a fight at the next bank holiday weekend. And to be honest with you, the way the media coverage it, covered it, the, the media pretty much gave them all the idea of, I know what I should do. I should go to a seaside town and have a fight with the opposite subculture. And lo and behold, the following bank holiday weekend, the mods drove down on their scooters, the rockers drove down on their motorbikes to these different seaside towns, and they did have a bit of a fight. I get nowhere near on the scale of the first one, but once again, the media was there covering it, filming it, writing about it, and created a huge amount of hysteria, again, about youth violence and the problems with youth today. Uh, it led to the police um, sending in more resources. The government um, gave them more powers of arrest and to detain uh, in order to control this kind of real social um, order issue. And Stanley Cohen argued there was a completely different reality to what was happening at these seaside towns because Stanley Cohen actually went there. He said it wasn't happening. That level of violence was not happening. That level of destruction was not happening. And there was a complete disconnect between what was happening in reality compared to what they were writing about in these newspapers. And he said they were two completely different worlds. But the problem being, the nation believes the newspaper because then all the nation wasn't there at the seaside town to see it for themselves. So um, that's his idea of um, how you talking about, if you like, the folk devils and moral panics using the mods and rockers case. Um, I just want to talk to you, I guess, about a few more recent um, examples and to talk about this idea of uh, scapegoats. Uh, this is where, like, um, this is kind of a Marxist and interactionist uh, theory where moral panics can actually be used in a more sinister way and they can be used to, if you like, scapegoat onto certain groups in order to distract from much more serious problems in society. Because when these moral panics have been reported on, the public are just interested in stories about that crime or that disorder rather than some of the most significant social problems going on, uh, particularly if those are problems to do with capitalism. Uh, and this really benefits those in power, according to Marxists and interactionists, because people stop complaining about how in unequal society is, for example, and instead start complaining about, well, the case I've given you there, uh, migrants or immigrants coming into the country and then stop the boats. It, it really shifts the narrative away from maybe some bigger, more significant problems in society. If you can blame that community uh, for, I don't know, hospital waiting lists or not being able to get into a local school or the fact that there's no jobs. If you can blame maybe migrants or immigrants, then you won't blame the government as much. And that does benefit the government, if you like, because it takes the pressure off them. Um, the cases that we've looked at in more detail was like the media coverage of knife crime in the sort of like mid 2000s. Um, this was arguably, and actually there's evidence suggests it definitely was a moral panic um, <clears throat> that targeted very much sort of young working class white and working class black groups. Um, the, we, we know that the media over reported on the number of knife uh, incidents because uh, the year prior to the moral panic, uh, knife uh, attacks were actually much higher um, and the year of the moral panic knife attacks had, had dipped off um, so there wasn't a new problem it would actually it was actually dropping at that point but the media over reported on it and Marxists and interactionists would say well arguably that could be distracting from uh, the media coverage of the financial crash that was going on at the time this huge banking bailout that was happening really to the benefit of capitalism 
And Stan Cohen, although he didn't write about this particular case, would highlight that it really did create deviancy amplification because people became so scared of knife crime, young people particularly and living in the cities, they started to carry knives. So that makes the problem worse because, you know, if, if someone has a knife, whether they've only got it for defensive reasons or, or not, if they have a knife, it makes knife crime far more likely and knife assault far more likely. Um, and the other uh, one we looked at was um, Stuart Hall's study on black mugging in the 1970s that we'll return to a bit later on. And he found a very similar thing. Um, he found that it, during the 1970s, there was huge unemployment, perhaps enormous. There were strikes, there were protests. There was a real sense that the government had got it wrong. Um, and then the media started reporting on black mugging. So there was a few incidents of black muggings and then the media started to report on it and report on it and report of it. And this led to huge amounts of policing of the black community, lots more like targeting them and arrests. And this made far more anger from the black community towards, towards the wider society, definitely triggered some self-fulfilling prophecies, particularly of um, young black men who felt that if they were going to be labelled and treated that way by the police and the media, then why don't they kind of turn to crime? And, and one of the consequences of this was it really made that the black community found it even harder to find jobs. You know, the majority that weren't committing crime found it much harder to find jobs. So crime, as a result, becomes a survival strategy. If you cannot support your family, then what else are you going to do? You can't let them starve. And Stuart Hall argued that this really was all because of this massive unemployment problem um, by distracting the media to focus on black youth as a big social order problem. I mean, they were no longer talking about the fact that the government had completely messed up the economy and people didn't have jobs, people didn't have homes, people didn't have enough food to eat, for example. So these are a number of examples of moral panics that you can use uh, to discuss in your um, exam papers. I'm just going to briefly finish on the evaluation um, like, or the strengths, if you like, of or weaknesses, I guess, of symbolic interactionism. So one of the big strengths is they really highlight the problems of crime statistics um, uh, because they point to unfair policing, the police over policing certain communities based on this typical offender stereotype. So that's another argument against um, the validity of official crime statistics. Uh, a big problem, though, is they do ignore the victim. And I know that when I teach it and when I think about it, you end up feeling really sorry for the criminals. You feel sorry for the black muggers. You feel sorry for um, the youth carrying knives. But ultimately, they are breaking the law. So should we? Be, maybe we shouldn't be feeling sorry for them, but you end up doing. And functionalists would say, actually... You, you know, they're ignoring the positive function of shaming criminals, okay? So calling them out and shaming criminals, giving them this master status of being a criminal, is it stops everybody else wanting to be a criminal. It, it acts as boundary maintenance. If, if we all see people who've committed crime and think, oh God, I don't want to be like them, look at everything they've lost, then we are less likely to commit crime. So symbolic interactionists, they're, they're labelling theory, it, and they do kind of ignore the fact that actually by doing that, the rest of us are less likely to commit crime because we can see the consequences. Thanks so much for listening. I hope it's been useful. Um, and yeah, good luck in all the exams. <laughs>